playoffs. Um, I remember their linebacker room was so nasty that, you know, the competition was so good that, you know, there was no portal. These guys were killing each other in practice and he loved it. And I don't know if Travis is that guy, but I think it's going to help for recruiting. I'm, I'm happy with these two hires if I'm a Miami fan, uh, you know, from a, from a recruiting aspect. Well, and yeah, and I'm, I, you know, I, I think, um, you know, a lot of Canes fans are, are very excited about, you know, what they will add in recruiting, especially in South Florida. I'm just, I mean, I, I'm equally as excited about, you know, how good they are, you know, developing, because like I said, that is, we've, we've been able to recruit well, but it's the developing. I mean, if you look at a guy like Gervin Hall, um, you know, he hasn't panned out or DJ Ivy at cornerback. So, um, when you look at James Williams, though, is there a certain player that um, is comparable to him that, that you've seen in the past? Because, I mean, he is a safety, but he is a large, large safety. I mean, he's a very, very unique player. So if you could think of someone to compare James Williams to, who would that be? Probably Shaq Thompson, who's with the Panthers now as a linebacker. Um, just a massive, and he's taller than, than Shaq Thompson, but just a massive safety that you could easily see being staying as a massive safety or, or moving to linebacker or playing that sort of in-between role, you know, like Derwin James did or like Jabril Peppers did at Michigan. Um, you know, Shaq Thompson was a freak athlete. Um, you know, hitting came last for him. And, and that's with James too. James has become more physical and more aggressive and that's why he got that fifth star. Um, and you know, he just started off his career as a, as a safety, but also a guy that they could bring on the blitz. And then he just grew and grew and grew and turned into a linebacker first rounder. Now he's an NFL really good player under the radar. I think that's who he is. Um, you know, everybody says, Oh, he's the next Ed Reed and all that. No, no, this kid's a monster. Um, you know, so that's what I see. And I see him being sort of a hybrid linebacker safety, which is so important to your defense. Uh, Isaiah Simmons, I don't want to say Isaiah Simmons, but that type of role uh, that he played at Clemson. So, I mean, obviously Miami Hurricanes fans are very high on James Williams, um, but we we lack the national perspective that that you get to have in, in your position at Rivals. Is James Williams potentially the kind of guy that can alter the course of a program? Uh, it's It takes more than one. Um, he's certainly a guy that can lead the defense, um, you know, and, and by that, I mean, inspire others. And, you know, there's other good defensive players in this class as well. So he's yeah. not going to have to do it by himself, but you can get a guy, you know, and, and, and Isaiah Simmons is an example or, or Jalen Ramsey is an example who is that hybrid, you know, they, I mean, James Williams can even play corner, corner, yeah. safety, linebacker. You know, you could blitz, you could play deep, you could play press. He's that type of guy that can be such a Swiss army knife in your defense that he's playing three different positions for you. Not at the same time, of course, but in, in, in certain sets, you can just put him where you want him. And that's what he could be. He's not there yet. But yes, okay. he could be a, a difference maker like those guys were. So one of the the biggest recruiting um, gets for Miami this year was, uh, you know, at the last minute before early signing day or on early signing day was uh, Jay Garcia um, decommits from USC. Two weeks later, he's he, uh, you know, signs with Miami, signs to Miami. Did that surprise you that he ultimately chose Miami? And then also, you know, what kind of impact you see him having uh, with the Hurricanes? And um, do you see him as a future starter at Miami? Yeah, he, he's going to be the guy, I think. You know, he's got that swagger at that West Coast. You know, quarterbacks of West Coast are different because – and now, you know, other areas are catching up because everybody's got a quarterback coach and there's QB universities everywhere. But, you know, on yeah. West Coast, those guys are made to be quarterbacks from age four. And, you know, he's he's got that, you know, size and gunslinger mentality. Um, you know, it reminds me a little bit of Matt Corral at Ole Miss um, from a okay. physical standpoint, from an arm talent standpoint, um, you know, and, and again, this is a kid who traveled across the country just to play a senior season. So you're getting a competitor and a kid who wants to play. So they've got Tyler and Dyke and, 
you know, they've got Jake and, and the quarterback room is getting a little bit better. Derek, hopefully, you know, back next season after the injury. And then you hand hand the ball off to one of those two guys. But Jake Garcia is going to be a guy. Um, you know, will he be great? Uh, I don't know. I mean, name the last great Miami quarterback. Um, <laughs> Ken Dorsey. So I can't say <laughs> that he's going to be. There's been a lot of highly rated guys that have gone off to Miami and, yeah. And and really, you know, floundered. But I think that's the talent around him. You know, Jake Garcia is going to be as good as his wide receiver group is and as good as his tight ends are and as good as his offensive line. I mean, he can't do it himself. Yeah, I yeah, I think, uh, you know, we're very, very high on on Jake and Jordan and I are both West Coast guys, actually. So we were we're very excited that that Jake chose Miami. I, I want to ask you, you know, we know about James Williams. We know about Jake Garcia. We know about Leonard Taylor. Who are some of maybe the under the radar players in this Miami class that stick out to you as guys that, um, you know, will be able to contribute and who you um, are very excited to see in the future? Yeah, I mean, the the three star has been absolutely destroyed in um, the the industry because, you know, um, when I was doing this and it was us and Scout. And ESPN was in it, but they didn't really rank three-star guys that much. They were just focused on the top guys. A three-star was a three-star. It, it was a very solid football player who was going to contribute possibly two years and be a honorable mention all-conference or potentially all-conference player. Uh, and then, you know, a, a new company came in, and I don't name them their name unless they want to pay me to, um, and gave everybody <laughs> three stars. You know, it's like, now you see three stars and Miami fans are like, oh, great. Another three star. These are good football players. I mean, Malik Curtis is a little tiny slot guy who could be a nightmare for teams because he he's so good in space and he can make people miss. Their offensive line, you know, with Rodriguez and McLaughlin, both of those guys, I mean, one's eight feet tall, McLaughlin's six foot eight, 295. <laughs> And, and the other one's an a, a undersized interior guy with a nasty attitude in Rodriguez. You know, they're projects right now, but in a couple of years, they're going to be good players. And their linebackers, Thomas Davis and Deshaun Troutman, are also very good players. They just lack one thing. You know, like Troutman's a sawed off. Okay, so he's a five seven three star. It doesn't mean he stinks. But in this industry now, if you're a three, it's a disappointment. And, and that, that kind of bugs me because you know i've been around so long where the the star system was kind of implemented when i was starting yeah uh so i i want people to have some perspective on this these are good football players uh khalil brantley could be the next brevin dixon at tight end he's an undersized guy could play outside flex he can't really play in line he's a five six three star but you just don't know so there's a lot of under the radar talent in this class you know, one one of those guys, and I, I call him the steal of of this class for Miami is Brashard Smith. Uh, you know, the slot receiver. What what are your thoughts on him? And um, you, you know, I'm I'm just very excited to see him in a Rhett Lashley offense. Um, just yeah. What are you What are your thoughts on him? And um, because I know Gator fans, they didn't really realize uh, how good he was until he uh, decommitted from Florida. Yeah, he's he's 158 in the country for us, so he's one of their higher-rated recruits. He's 5'10", so he's not a tall target, but he's built like a running back. So he's like 200 pounds and very, very thick. So he's going to bounce off people, um, and he does have excellent speed. And he's a versatile kid. I mean, he can do a lot of different things. Like, he's, he could return. You could use him in a running back set if you wanted to. He's a really, really good blocker. And, and, you know, again, that's a forgotten thing when you're evaluating prospects. But this is a physical football player who's going to do whatever it takes for his team. And that means go across the middle. Um, he'll do whatever. So I, I like him. He doesn't have the elite, you know, 10, 300 meter speed that you want uh, to be a five star. But he's going to bounce off people and make a lot of yards after catch. That's what I like about him. Do you, do you see these, I mean, because you got Brashard Smith, Romello Brinson, Jacoby George. Do you see these Miami receivers, you know, turning a new page, um, you know, as opposed to the last few years where we haven't really been able to develop uh, wide receivers? That's uh, completely on the coaches because their, their talent is there. 
you know, yeah. when I look at this wide receiver class, it's, it's you know, there's four guys I got and, and three of them are four stars. The talent is there. Uh, each of them have their limitations. You know, Burchard isn't the tallest guy in the world. Romello is not the fastest guy in the world. Jacoby is really tiny, but they can be utilized in the proper way, uh, especially in, in, in offenses that are spreading you out. Uh, but that's on the coaches. I mean, yes, could happen, but it also, you know, they could also be in the portal or fall on their face or get hurt. I mean, you just don't know. Um, you have to recruit kids that want to play that play with a passion and an anger and that want to get better and when the chips are down rise up and and that's what i think is lacking at miami um you know i I talked to mario cristobal yesterday he used to play on on the u during the great days he said if somebody was (laughs) if somebody was complaining about something you know ray lewis would jack him up in the locker room that's it shut up <laughs> let's go you know yeah. and, and you need that type of leadership and i'm not sure who it's going to be but somebody needs to take over from a player aspect and 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 then coaching these kids got to get better yeah i i had a we interviewed dan celio one time on this on this podcast and he told us a story about um i think it was george myra the second was complaining about something and and michael irvin punched him square in the face and knocked mm-hmm. his teeth out <laughs> so yeah. That's how it was, man. And that's how, you know, nowadays there'd be lawsuits, you'd be kicked out of school. And, you know, it's a different world we live in, but somebody needs to grab somebody by the collar and say, wake up or just get out, you know, and and you can't just coddle these kids, you know, because that's what they're used to during the recruiting process. And they're told they're the greatest thing ever. And, oh, my God, we love you so much. And then they get on campus and they're treated like freshmen and they don't know what to do with themselves. So a guy like Richard Smith, I have no question whatsoever that he's going to be a self-motivated individual. And you can yeah. tell just by the way he runs, just how the way he blocks, just how much he hustles and how he never wants to go down. The other yeah. guys, I, I don't know. And, and we can tell in camps and I'm working blind this year. You know, we had a camp in Miami. We had a camp in Orlando. But, you know, the, the pandemic shut us down in March. But I, I could tell you. You could tell the lazy kids from the from the ones that want to compete in camps, yeah. and that's why people say underwear camps don't count. Yeah, they do. You know, uh, the, the guys that don't care are more likely than not not going to pan out. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I, I go wanna, ahead, Jordan. I want to ask you about. Uh, I know it's been a few years since he was a recruit, so uh, you know, hopefully you you remember a little bit of of what we can expect, but. Charleston Rambo, the former OU wide receiver, just transferred to Miami. Um, do you remember him much? Like, like, are you familiar with his game? Yeah. I mean, Rambo was a highly ranked kid um, coming out of high school. Uh, the only issue that he had and still hasn't solved is the drops issue. Um, and that's kind of what got him in a little bit of hot water, um, you know, because it's so competitive at Oklahoma when it comes to yeah. the wide receivers, you know, they throw the ball so much. And you're going to be a star if you catch the ball. But if you drop a few, you know, you're finding yourself on the bench, for, you know, and you're 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 the fourth guy in a three wide out set and you're not on the field. He was a top 100 player, very fluid, very smooth, very fast. Hands were erratic. Uh, route running has gotten better. But if he can be consistent catching the football, he could be wide receiver one for you guys right away. Cool. Well, yeah, I mean, that that, that might not be too hard to do, though. No. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> depends on if he drops every pass. I mean, then oh. he's just another one of your guys. He, he came exactly. to the right school. We're, we're becoming drop university mm-hmm. at this point. Oh, it's, it's, it's so frustrating. Like, it's embarrassing. It's so frustrating. I mean, I, I watched a couple of the games, you know, just from a scouting perspective on – on these guys and it's just like you know oh he got his head up field too early or he lost concentration no they just are not attacking the football they're letting it get to them and it's just it's it's miserably embarrassing so I, when, when that happens like when it, when a player doesn't live up to uh you know expectations I, how much do you think is it you know in their own head and mental and how much is um can you uh, of the blame can you place on, you know, position coaches and whatnot? 
Uh, listen, it's hard, you know, it's hard to blame position coaches because you don't know what's going on every day in practice and you don't know what they're telling these kids. I mean, you could tell a kid a thousand times, you know, don't drop passes. You could work with them in the jug.